This is Ted Keenan for Daily Dispatch. There has been an amazing increase in the spate of robberies, many violent, some deaths that have occurred in East London. Today we are talking to uh, Brett Harvey from Red Alert Electronic Security and Armed Response. Um, I'm in charge of our armed response vehicles and our emergency EMS ambulances and we focus on mainly being proactive against crime and obviously reactive when crimes happen. Brett, apparently the escalation over the past two weeks has been quite frightening. We've had deaths. What is the main target of the people that are involved in these robberies and violence? Yes, absolutely. Now, I'd say the last two, three weeks have got extremely bad. Um, main targets for the thefts is um, what I would say is cash, uh, things like cigarettes, airtime, easy to sell items. Um, not that the values are very high, but you can get rid of them really quickly. The, the numbers that one reads about in dispatch at the moment are up to seven or eight guys involved in, in one hit. The reward can't be that spectacular. No, um, in a lot of these cases it isn't. Um, syndicates and armed robbers do range from four to eight to sometimes even ten. Um, but some of the amounts they get in away with is sometimes as little as a thousand rand. Um, and in a recent uh, armed robbery where someone's actually lost their life, that is what they got away with was a thousand rand. They're going to have to do a lot more robberies to be able to make this a paying proposition. Yes, unfortunately that is the case, um, and that's why you would see the frequency of the actual robberies um, is, is, is going up, and this is now happening more and more on a daily basis and more per day. When these guys walk into a shop or run into a shop, whatever, what is the modus operandi? What are they, how do they treat the people? Is there, is there sort of a, a normal pattern or are they all individualistic? I would say that the pattern's pretty varied. Um, it depends on the actual criminal or the, the gang itself. You get sometimes where the guys will treat people respectfully and then you other have others that are a lot more violent. Um, a big thing is, is they just want to be in control. If they feel out of control, they're more dangerous. Um, and they want to get the goods that they want and they want to get out. And if anybody gets in their way, being a person of law enforcement, security, or even a civilian, they usually react in a violent way against that person. And um, either they're going to hurt that person or they're going to kill that person. There's a few aspects that come out of that. One is that I would imagine that the high professionals are not violent. They don't want a case of murder against them. So, as you say, they want to get in, get out. What sort of people are doing this? There are reports that they might be ex-security people, they might be ex-army people, ex-police, but certainly highly trained. Yes. Um, we do believe that there's a range of criminals that's working. So you do get your amateur criminals. A, a lot of the time they're a lot younger men that are just desperate and they don't know what they're doing. They, I would say, are quite dangerous because they're in a very nervous state. Your more professional criminal, if you want to call them that, or a, a syndicate member, usually they do have some form of training, be it law enforcement, military, ex-security, um, or even just training from someone with the knowledge of. But the, the more highly organised guys are trained to an extent. What sort of weapons are you seeing now? Is there a big change from, say, 10 years ago to what the chaps are using today? Absolutely. You know, 10 years ago, we would normally encounter a knife at an armed robbery or at the very most a handgun. Now you'll see handguns, the common thing, and you even get in higher caliber weapons like carbines such as uh, R5s, those type of weapons, which are fully automatic, which is an extremely difficult weapon to fight against. Have there been any casualties amongst your teams? Um, yes, in the past I have had uh, a few casualties, unfortunately. Um, but that, that is just the name of the game. Um, 
we have also apprehended a hell of a lot of armed robbery suspects. Um, but yes, we have lost team members. The people that are going in here, what percentage of these do you imagine are, let us describe them as the foot soldiers? They're not going to make a lot of money out of that. They work for somebody. But if there's foot soldiers, there's commanders. Are we, have we got big syndicates behind this? I would say there's a portion of it that is definitely big syndicates, but then you also get a lot of um, what we would say individual members in a unit that take a cut from it. So I would say it's probably a 50-50 when it comes to a syndicate with a head that has foot soldiers and then a team of criminals that is splitting it uh, whichever way. Can you paint us a picture, please, of your operation Let's say you get an alarm call. Sure. T take us through the procedure, please. So what would usually happen, um, let, let's say in an armed robbery situation, you see guys come in, they're armed. Um, what actually normally happens is people don't have the time to push something like a panic button, but if they do, um, and the panic's silent, so the criminal doesn't know we're on the way, which happens a lot of the time. What usually happens is we'll get there, our armed response team, knowing that it's a panic alarm, is already sent back up. We would approach the building very carefully, judging foot by foot going towards the door. What are we actually seeing? Once we see inside and we see there is a problem, you normally call for additional backup and you have to judge the situation as it goes because you also don't want to put civilians' lives at risk. Once that happens, then we would go into what we would call our tactical teams and our tech, um, uh, our, uh, sorry, our tactical teams yeah. and our procedures on to app apprehending those armed robbers. Um, and what normally happens is we either get into a shootout or we can disarm them without them actually discharging their weapons. Do you immediately notify the police so that they can be on the scene as soon as possible, or is it? muddling the, 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 the issue if you've got your force and police force there together? What we do is we, without a doubt, we need SAPS backup. We work very well with the SAP. Um, immediately, if we do confirm that something is going wrong, SAPS are immediately asked to, to, to come assist and they actually come and we, they, we fall under them in an operation and then we attack the scene together. But a lot of the time, you don't have the time for that. Um, a lot of the time, the officers on the ground have to make the decisions because the guys are coming out at them. You guys spend a lot of money and a lot of time on training. What sort of training do you give people who are your reactionary force? Sure. So a lot of the guys, you do what we call security grades, arm response courses, those type of things. Where we try to be a bit more proactive is we do advanced training courses when it comes to firearms and firearm drills. We also get a lot of instructors in for your hand-to-hand -hand combat, self-defense, arrest techniques, those type of things. More so that our officers, officers can be prepared to handle any situation they do get thrown in. The feeling at the moment, if you look at the news reports and that, is that the police are not doing a particularly good job. But with the huge increase in crimes, you know, we hark back to the June, July looting in KwaZulu-Natal, the police are under enormous pressure. Do you think they should be doing better or are you an admirer of the police having worked so closely with them? I talk on behalf of my officers as well. We're huge admirers. Um, unfortunately, the, the SAP, their resources are quite scarce and they have fewer members than they ever have had. So the amount of police officers needs to be upped and their resources that they are given to fight crime. When prosecutions occur, if these people are arrested, do your chaps have to spend a long time in the magistrate's court? Yes, we normally do. Depending on the case, we've had cases that can last two or three months and we've got cases that go up to three to four years. Um, it depends, in on the, depends on the severity of the case. Um, you know, an armed robber murder case to a, a housebreaking theft or a cable theft, it, it all depends. The role of scrap dealers, 
can't be ignored. In the old days, there used to be the saying, if you don't want it stolen, bolt it down. Today, bolting it down doesn't help. Yes, yeah, bolting theft it everywhere. down. everywhere. No, bolting it down definitely doesn't help. They've got the tools to unbolt it or cut it, cut it off. Um, as far as scrap dealers are concerned, you obviously have a lot of scrap dealers that follow the law and legally know they cannot buy BCM, uh, copper cable, those type of things, but then also you've got a whole bunch that don't follow it and have ways and loopholes around the law. Those are the ones that's fueling that this uh, current epidemic of uh, Municipal municipal property theft. Just let's talk about the municipal property theft, theft for a second. You were talking about people stealing wire from little fuse boxes and that sort of thing. Give us a few examples of where they will steal something that costs a fortune to replace and in fact get less than 50 rand for what they've stolen. No, 100%. Um, you know, we've been... We've been seeing from light poles to water meters to cutting down of cables and those type of things. But some of the values of these things are, like you say, 50 rand. The problem is, um, I heard recently an estimate that just to replace something like a water meter costs BCM 15,000 rand. So, I mean, for what they get into, what it costs the municipality to replace that item is absolutely ridiculous. That's why we're treating it as an epidemic. The epidemic, as you now call it, goes right through to traffic lights. One of our senior journalists was driving through one of the roads and every single traffic light was vandalised. What do they take out of the traffic lights? Any, any object that has a little bit of wiring in it is a target. From a traffic light to a light pole... It doesn't matter what it is. If it's got any form of wire or cable in it, it's, a, it, it's going to be a target. What's the journey for that metal once it's sold to the scrap dealer? And as you said, scrap dealers are not all criminals. In fact, most of them are 100% honest businesses. But for the, the bad guys, once they buy that scrap metal, what's the journey what, well, what I'm assuming they do is they usually melt it down so it, it doesn't have that resemblance of municipal cable. And then they would sell it on to whoever they would sell it on, whoever their, their buyers are. Um, now, either their buyers know that it's illegal or their buyers are just taking it as a melted down product. The, we spoke syndicates earlier. There has to be syndicates involved in that. You can't have a scrap metal dealership that's got smelters that are consuming a massive amount of electricity and not being able to identify them. Sure. Surely they should not be able to melt anything until it's been inspected. I would agree with that. You know, um, we've had syndicates stealing massive amounts of cable. Um, just the other day, we arrested a syndicate that had 500,000 rands worth of uh, electrical cable in two vehicles. Uh, that was in Cambridge. But then we've also got other elements of people that just don't have money or people that are doing narcotics that are stealing the small amounts just to sell so they can get their fix. So it goes from massive organized crime to poverty and people that just really need money. Well, with 46% of people unemployed in South Africa, they're having to do something. And I'm assuming that a lot of the people that are involved in this are absolutely poverty-stricken and will do anything to feed their families, not that it makes it right. Would yes. you concur? Yes, I will. Um, that's, the that, that's the unfortunate thing. So, yeah, a lot of the time it is, it is directly related to the economy, um, and that's why you can see it's got worse. Inflation, goods going up. That, that, that's why we've seen this increase, um, uh, I would say, more than 100% in the last year. With this increase, as you say, doubling, has the type of theft changed? You, would, you spoke earlier about getting stuff that can move quickly and then getting out. I would definitely say they do target certain things. It depends on the syndicate or, or the criminal. You know, you have a massive variation of both. Um, you do get a lot of the guys that prefer the big heist 
like a CRT van or a courier van. That, that, that's a different syndicate altogether to, to a criminal or a syndicate that's hit going for your go-quick items like cigarettes, airtime, uh, quick, um, small amounts of cash. Um, so so it's, a, it's a big variation, but they, all criminals target specific things. Yeah. The syndicates, if we can focus on them, are they mainly East London or... The chaps that are stealing the big amounts, are they based somewhere else? In the past, we've definitely seen guys that have come from out of town, um, mainly your Gauteng areas. Um, but of recent, we do have quite a few syndicates that are local, or, or syndicates, gangs, criminals that are local, but we also do have a lot of outsiders, especially that come in this time of year. The old Robin Hood type robbers who stole from the rich and gave to the poor... Have we got an element of those in this? I would say no. Um, you, um, you know, you do obviously have people that have to steal maybe to provide for their family, but uh, I, that's not the vast majority, no. What's the future? What can be done to counter this and, in fact, to eradicate it? Well, right now, it, it's a very hard question to, to answer. Obviously, better economic times would help. With certain in certain ways, with but I think one of the biggest issues is your syndicates, your gangs, your greedy type criminal. They just doing it for the money. They're not doing it to feed their families. So there, we need to catch these people. We need to arrest them. We need harsher sentences um, to to uh, circumvent those type of people. Have you had to employ more guards? Yes. Um, Actually, recently, we've started a new community safety campaign five times more, where we've actually put in five times more infrastructure in the Buffalo City and Stutterham areas, purely focused on proactive work. So doing your crime prevention patrols and all those type of things, that's how we get in the results we are. I met a group of teachers just recently who were telling me that when they ask 13, 14 year olds, what they would like to do. A staggering st number of them suggested that they would like to be armed robbers. They want to drive the flash motor cars, they want the flash girlfriends, and they want to be able to drink the most exotic liquor. So perhaps there is just no come back for this until these kids can get jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, education, jobs is going gonna, is gonna to play a massive role in this. Um, Obviously, the lure of the flashy cars and the exotic drinks and all those things is great for a kid now, but once that kid's in it, you'll see that it's not quite as pretty as it's painted out to be. Daily Dispatch has been talking to Brett Harvey. Brett, thank you for your time, and tough being at the sharp end. No, thank you very much.